Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council, and I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Friday, October 30th. Before we begin, I'll note that this meeting has remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the provision, provisions of Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Cunningham. Present. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Palmasano. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. Council Member Reich. Here. Council Member Fletcher. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Osman. Present. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Palmasano. Council Member Cano. Council Member Fletcher. Vice President Jenkins. Here. President Bender. Here. There are nine members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. The agenda is before us. There are two amendments to the agenda. The first is under new business to amend the emergency resolution related to the declared state of local public health emergency. And the second is amending the agenda to allow for the honorary resolution, recognizing Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'll move those two amendments. Is there a second? Second. Are there any other amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll on the agenda as amended. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Yes. Aye. Council Member, Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. And there are 12 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted as amended. Next, we have the minutes from our regular meeting of October 16th for acceptance. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those minutes are accepted. Next we have the referrals of petitions, communications and reports to the proper committees. May I have that motion please? So moved. Second. Thank you. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. 
Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those matters are referred. With that, we'll proceed to the order of new business, beginning with the mayor's regular report on the state of our local health emergency, addressing the city's response to COVID-19. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you for the opportunity to share this regular update uh, and COVID report. I'll, I will dive right in. Uh, we have 19 emergency regulations to date. Um, there was one additional emergency regulations that I signed just yesterday, uh, and that is pertaining to uh, homeless shelters. As you know, the city of Minneapolis has committed nearly $2 million in COVID response funds uh, to the Indoor Villages product, Project, which will provide shelter and support uh, for 100 people experiencing homelessness. And we collectively as a city made very clear from the very beginning that we wanted CARES dollars largely uh, to go to those that were struggling most. Um, and in, in this case, that is definitely those who are experiencing homelessness and unsheltered homelessness. Now, again, we put in the $2 million, Hennepin County committed $2.2 million in CARES uh, dollars funding. And the state of Minnesota provided uh, 2 million in operating funds using COVID relief funding. Uh, and as you know, the early, somewhat early onset of, of cold weather and snow using COVID relief funding uh, made this something that we needed to expedite even quicker. Uh, and the reality that the CARES funding uh, will uh, need to be spent by the end of the year to comply with the federal rules necessitated that we really expedite this approval process to ensure that the lease for the space which we're using, it's a warehouse, uh, could be signed uh, and construction can begin by next week. So uh, again, signature was yesterday, construction will begin next week uh, um, and that'll allow the process to move forward as expeditiously as possible. Um, and the city will continue to work closely with the project team to ensure that it stays on track and is up and running by the end of the year. Um, I won't get into the logistics of the, the indoor villages as I know you all are very familiar and have all been working on it as well. Um, the uh, total approximate, moving on to health by the numbers, the total approximate number of completed tests uh, is 2,739,997. Uh, That's more than 300,000 um, more um, than last report. Um, and just got some somewhat concerning numbers. Um, the the, the one-day totals that, that will will be published today are, are certainly going up and we are hitting uh, what we believe to be record numbers. And so um, those, those, those figures should tell us that we really need to keep our foot on the gas on this and that we are um, when you keep keeping our foot on the gas and need to remain as diligent as possible because the, the numbers are exceedingly clear. Uh, they, are, they are going up, especially as the onset of cold weather comes. Uh, for Minnesota case information, the total positive uh, is 139,444 uh, with 123,529 patients who no longer need to be isolated uh, and tragically 2,387 deaths. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the Hennepin County numbers here to go to uh, hospitalization. Uh, total cases hospitalized right now are 9,855. Uh, total cases hospitalized in the ICU are 2,609. Uh, for Minneapolis specific case information, uh, the total positive uh, cases is 13,234 uh, with total hospitalized 1,305. Um, 12,199 have recovered and and tragically 260 deceased. Um, you should have uh, a graph there uh, showing both race and ethnicity um, and certainly our health department can answer any questions about that uh, data. Moving on to the health department and the situational update. Uh, as of October 30th, there are 13,234 cases in Minneapolis and 260 deaths, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, hospitalizations increased by 3.9% and ICU admissions increased by 3.3%. Uh, people under age still make up over, um, people under age 35 still make up uh, over 50% of cases over the past week, but we are starting to see a decrease in those under 25 and an increase in those 25 and older. Uh, as of October 
uh, 21st, the state is reporting 29.9 cases per 100,000, and Minneapolis is at 22.6 cases per 100,000. Uh, these numbers put Minnesota in what is known as the red category while keeping Minneapolis in the orange category. Uh, the red category is categorized as, as, as a tipping point, which might indicate the need for more stringent safety measures. Um, obviously, we're pleased to to not be in the red category and still be in the orange category, but that is that, that, that in, in no small part is because we've been taking some fairly uh, aggressive measures to make sure that people are safe and, and, and they are healthy and that the, the necessary social and physical distancing requirements remain in place. Uh, so for case investigation and contact tracing, the, the health department is conducting over 50 case investigations and contact follow-ups per day for individuals diagnosed with COVID-19. Uh, of the 13,234 cases in Minneapolis, 84.1% uh, have been interviewed, 2.4% have refused, and 10.4% have been lost to follow-up. Uh, approximately 3% of new cases uh, still need to be interviewed. 25% of interviews of Minneapolis residents have been conducted in a language other than English. And beginning November 5th, MHD will be responsible for following up on all Minneapolis cases in the past. Um, in the past, they have split the caseload with state and contact tracers. Uh, moving on to community COVID-19 testing and, and flu shots. Uh, so in partnership with communications, uh, MHD uh, is developing a new ad campaign in multiple languages to pr promote COVID-19 community testing. That campaign will launch on November 1st and will include targeted social media and community newspaper ads, uh, new uh, dedicated testing web, web pages on the city's web site, uh, donated billboard space, radio spots, and then videos as well. And on October 22nd and 23rd, MHD supported a state-led free testing event uh, at uh, Sagrado Corazon Church in South Minneapolis and Shiloh Temple in North. MHD is continuing to explore options for indoor testing events during the winter months, as well as purchasing saliva test kits that can be used at community events or for at-home testing. Uh, moving on to COVID-19 vaccination, uh, last week, MHD hosted discussions about a COVID vaccination with Mayflower Church and Lao Assistance Center of Minnesota, the Division of Indian Work and the Sheridan Neighborhood Association. Common themes from these presentations include concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine approval process, questions about flu shots, and questions about timing of vaccine distribution. Um, moving on to Halloween messaging. Uh, we put out some fun Halloween guidance this last week. Uh, and there should be a link to the video message in your report as well. Um, even more important perhaps than the, the video message is the underlying uh, data and guidance that was also submitted and I, you can you should be able to check that out as well. Uh, we want to make sure of, of course that people are able, are able to have fun over Halloween, but but safety is of paramount importance here. Uh, as of October 28, 2020, there has been uh, 5,597,365 spent. This is an increase of 21,906 for COVID testing support. Uh, this report includes only purchases made through emergency purchasing regulation, which allows for emergency COVID-19 purchases to be expedited to respond to urgent COVID-19 response needs. Purchases made through the normal procurement process are not included in this report. Uh, both the emergency purchases and purchases made through normal procurement processes are tracked and will be included in the city's total COVID-19 response cost at the end of the pandemic. Again, the total cost far exceeds uh, the amount included in the emergency purchase report. <clears throat> um, there are, you have many numbers regarding uh, uh, public safety. Um, uh, the, we're happy to answer questions to the extent we can or if the chief is on but again that's not part of, of this of this COVID-19 related report. Um, moving on to some of the work that FIRE is doing. Um, MFD is continuing virtual classroom visits teaching fire safety and prevention to some of the young kids grades K through three um, and and safety and prevention messaging continues to go out via next door. Um, Moving on to food security. Uh, 500,000 in CRF funds uh, were allocated 
to the health department to support community food security efforts. Uh, 470,000 has been uh, allocated to COVID-19 community food security support grants and 30,000 to support health department food security initiatives to address gaps in service. Uh, rapid response applications for COVID-19 community uh, food security support grants were accepted through noon on Wednesday, October 28th. Uh, and eligible groups uh, are organizations that provide emergency food relief, including but not limited to food shelves, food banks, food pop-ups, or farmers market distributing, uh, distributing uh, free food. And there's a lot of really great work that's happening here, and I think it, it really deserves to be highlight, highlighted. Uh, groups, must, groups must serve the city of Minneapolis, provide emergency support related to COVID-19 pandemic, and must demonstrate an ability to purchase items and provide receipts by November 13th, 2020. The health department has already received uh, 46 applications, totaling funding requests of uh, 1,243,462. Uh, applications are under review now. Uh, for gap funding uh, package, the community prevention partners and Minneapolis Public Housing Authority and city staff continue to work through the list uh, to complete the full verification and approval process for each applicant. Uh, as of Wednesday, October 28th, uh, 1,433 applications have been approved, totaling uh, $2,245,567. Uh, $45,567 in emergency assistance payments. And again, the small business forgivable loans have been fully awarded. Uh, thank you for your time today. and I'm happy, happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the mayor? Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Mayor. I'm hoping that you can maybe say something about election security. I can. I would defer most of that to the combination of our of our city clerk as well as our police chief if he is on um, for uh, months now. Uh, we have been working to ensure the full integrity of our elections process and that every single person in every single precinct has full and accessible al uh, access, uh, has full access to the ballot box. Um, you know, that will not be infringed in any way, shape or form. We are uncompromising on our commitment on this front. And we've been working with a number of different jurisdictional partners to ensure that that safety and that access is met in full. Um, I know our clerk um, has ha will once again have, I don't remember the exact term, but marshals um, at each one of the precinct locations. Um, those marshals can then be in touch with the necessary law enforcement or authorities to assist in any matter that is infringing on that uh, on those rights on those inalienable rights um, and i know that our chief as well as myself have been uh, in collaboration with a number of different jurisdictional partners to get additional assistance if needed um, and so again um, we're, we will be unflinching and uncompromising on on our standards here uh, and we know that you know this coming tuesday election day the days preceding and the days following are going to be of paramount importance um, that you know safety is ensured and that this election is is conducted fairly and with complete integrity um mr clerk do, would you care to, to comment uh, more fully perhaps on some of the the work that you are doing and or the chief mr mayor you summarized it quite well and i would only add that in addition to all of the preparations that we have made as a city enterprise we are uh, also connected very closely and working in close partnership, as the mayor alluded, with our partners at both the county, the state and federal levels. And so all levels of government have been activated and are partnering and have been partnering for many months now on this issue. And that includes, of course, the secretary of state himself and his office, as well as the attorney general. And I would also amplify the messaging that the attorney general has offered in the last few weeks, which is that he takes seriously any uh, threats, any intimidation or suppression of voters' rights and would vigorously pursue the same. And so I would only echo what the mayor has said and say that our voters should feel confident that our ballots um, will be accepted and that voting is safe and secure here in Minneapolis. Thank you, Mr. Clerk and Council Vice President. Uh, if I may add just one one other item, not 
necessarily related to safety or security, uh, but is certainly related to the integrity of this voting process. Um, there was a decision that came down through the Eighth Circuit uh, just last night related to the ability to receive and count ballots after election day itself, regardless of when those ballots were put in the mail. Um, and the, the conclusion, and Mr. Clerk, correct me if I'm getting this even slightly wrong, was that um, ballots received after election day will not, uh, as of right now, be counted. And the, the, the conclusion is that if you have a ballot in your hand, if you had requested a ballot and you presently have one, turn it in in person uh, to, an, uh, to one of our sites. Um, in person to one of our, you can always certainly vote on election day, you can always vote early, but if you have one of those ballots, rather than put in the mail to ensure that it is received by election day, just drop it off at one of our sites. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I, I believe those uh, you refer to as marshals are called sergeant of arms. Uh, the clerk can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I just don't want to give the impression that there will be armed people in the polling locations. Marshals implies, you know, law Good enforcement. So. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure the, the name of the or the term. You, you are correct, though, Council Vice President. They, they are not armed. Um, and sergeant of arms is the proper term. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Schrader. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Mayor and uh, Clerk, for the the great uh, kind of um, answers about like what we're doing about election security. But I, I do want to, you know, name um, that a lot of this uh, we need to be talking about what uh, the Trump campaign did with the police federation the trump campaign called upon the police federation to have poll watchers um, so this is the police federation that's made up of our rank and file uh, officers and I, I think there needs to be a little bit more to the the plans that are said to help people how the um, mpd and everyone will be held accountable to that standard I mean, we have you know outside forces that have a very different set agenda uh, for this election and we need to not only have a plan to keep everybody safe but a plan to make sure that everything is accountable and transparent and that people are assured that everything will be safe at the polls thank you council member schrader uh, i agree i share your frustration um as as was reported uh or it was reported that that the request uh, going through the Federation went to retired officers, but nonetheless, um, it is it is certainly concerning and we're doing everything that we can um, again to ensure the full integrity and we're we're standing by that. Thank you, though. I, I do agree. Madam, Madam President, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt there. If I could interject one point about um, the challengers that are in polling places that was alluded to? Yes, thank you, Mr. Carl. Uh, just, just because I really wanna make sure we have accurate information to the voters, and I know many people will be tuning in to hear this information. Um, challengers, of course, are allowed within polling places under Minnesota election law. It does help preserve the integrity of that process. So where legitimately appointed, either by candidates or parties, challengers do fulfill that good role. It is important to note that under Minnesota election law, however, that challengers who are appointed to serve in the polling places must have personal knowledge in order to contest a voter's eligibility to get a ballot. That cannot include just mere suspicion. It can't include, I don't think that this person is eligible. You have to have personal knowledge. Also, challengers may not interact with voters in the polling places. They cannot speak to voters. They can't ask to see information about voters. They merely can contest based on personal knowledge that they share with the head election judge whether or not a voter is eligible. But that voter has the right to work with the head judge to prove their eligibility and to go ahead and get their ballot. So I don't want people to hear 
uh, I don't want the voters to hear that challengers in the polling place in any way would prohibit them from going forward and accessing their ballot. It is a legitimate checking point within our system, but it has limits and those limits are very strictly confined based on personal knowledge that that voter has to contest an eligibility of another voter and the head judges are extensively trained in order how to administer those challenging processes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Call. I think what was so frustrating about the Federation's um, email, you know, which is hard to imagine that they didn't know would be public, is that it seemed to have language that was really targeting populations in Minneapolis that, among other things, have lower voter turnout. And you can see in the ward breakdown so far with early voting where you know, it, two things are true. People are turning out in Minneapolis in unprecedented numbers for early voting, and there's a disparity across our city in in the percent of folks who voted so far. Um, and those places that have higher concentrations of communities of color, higher concentrations of poverty, higher renter populations are voting in lower numbers so far. And so, you know, we want to make sure that people feel safe and comfortable um, we know, you know, we know the Federation is tapping into fear around law enforcement and um, and it makes it very frustrating. And I know the chief put out a strong statement, but Mr. Carl, what should you do if you're at your voting location and something feels not right? You feel scared. You're not sure what's happening is right or legal, um, especially like, is there a civilian response? Is there a number to call? How do voters access support? Um, in a way that they feel most comfortable, say they're at their polling location on election day. Thank you, Madam President. That's a very good point. All voters should know that the head judge, the assistant head judge in every single polling place is there to monitor activities. They're really not assigned to handle the processing of ballots. They're there to serve voters. Any voter who has even an inkling of a concern, a question or, or uh, an issue that they just want confirmed should immediately go see the head or assistant head election judge, make themselves available of, their ju of those judges. Their job is to help address and resolve any issues in the polling place. If, however, the raising it to the head judge or assistant head judge isn't satisfactory to a voter or they don't feel it's been done correctly or they just don't feel they can do that in the polling place in that moment. Every voter in the United States should make good use of the team of highly trained and experienced lawyers who work with election protection. And you should call the election protection hotline, report your issue. Every single year, no matter what the election is, our elections team works very closely with election protection, with Common Cause, the League of Women Voters, and other voter advocacy groups. We share our plans with them and they respond. They have direct access to our elections headquarters on election day. So if a voter calls election protection, I can assure them we will be hearing from election protection and we will immediately respond to those concerns. So again, the first line of defense in a civilian sense for any voter is the head election and assistant head election judge in the polling place. Thank you. And I mean, it's unfortunate that we even have to be talking about this. Minnesota has such a strong record of voting access, of nonpartisan voter protection, of, you know, a, a bipartisan or multipartisan. We saw the former governors all come together to um, send a message about our history of voting in Minnesota. Um, I, I did note that perhaps someday we'll have some more diversity than was was reflected in the video, but of a different kind. But um, so, you know, we have safe voting in Minnesota. We have supported voting, um, you know, so it's it, you know, we hopefully those systems that have been in place for many, many years are the ones that folks will be using this, you know, on Tuesday. So thank you for that. I don't see any other questions. I'll pause though to see if my colleagues have any last questions or comments. And thank you all for talking about this. It's I know we spent some time on it, but I, I know it's really important. We're getting a lot of questions. And Mr. Carl has noted in the chat that the election protection hotline is 1-866-R-VOTE, 1-866-R-VOTE. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and 
everyone for that presentation. And that concludes that item. We do have um, the uh, resolution that the mayor noted, um, which would update for the emergency declaration related, related to the shelter, um, the tiny home shelter. Um, but I will direct the clerk to receive and file the report first. And then we will go to the ratification of the declared state of local public health emergency with that updated item. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Madam President. As in all prior instances, each time the mayor has issued an emergency regulation, we bring forward a new resolution to amend this ongoing state of local public health emergency such that those emergency regulations continue to be promulgated and carry forward throughout the length of this emergency period. You'll note that uh, as shown on the screen now, the current resolution would include those amendments to add the most recent emergency uh, regulation issued by the mayor yesterday, which he's already discussed. And so that incorporates that within this resolution, uh, ratifying and extending those provisions through the term of the emergency uh, period within the city of Minneapolis by the city council. Thank you, Mr. Carl. This is the resolution piece, and then it does also include that new emergency declaration as well. Do you have that available to put up? Otherwise, I know it was sent yesterday. Uh, Madam President, we're showing that on the screen now, and so we should have uh, the ability for the public to also see. And of course, immediately after this meeting, all the documents will be uploaded to LIMS for public access. Great, thank you. And I, you know, I just want to pause in and thank Councilmember Goodman so much for all of her efforts on this Tiny Homes project. I know we had some time to talk about it in committee, but I think absent um, the relationships, Councilmember, that you formed over your years in office, I don't think that project would be moving forward so swiftly. So thanks for your leadership and everything you've done there. Any other uh, questions or comments? I will go ahead and move this item. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that is adopted as the amend amended resolution is adopted. That brings us to the order of reports from our standing committees. We'll begin with the report from the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee presented by the Chair Council Member Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for your kind comments just now. The Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee is bringing forward 19 items for approval this morning. Item number one is an application for Brother Justice Whiskey. Item number two, three, and four are all property assessed clean energy financing projects. These are projects for solar primarily assessed back to the owners paid for by the energy savings. Item number five is an interim use permit for an intentional community cluster development. Item number six is granting an appeal by the Marshall Terrace neighborhood with regard to a variance. Item seven are the liquor license approvals and eight are the gambling license approvals. Item number nine are business operating conditions for interstate parking. Item 10 is a contract amendment with element for managing the Upper Harbor Services area. Item number 11 is Hennepin County's HRA um, project at 5637 Lindale and 143 19th Street Southeast. Item number 12 are a long list of applications for environmental grant funding. This is the 2020 Brownfield round. These are applications that are going to deed as well as the tax based revitalization account and Hennepin County's environmental response fund. Item number 13 are grant applications to the Livable Communities Demonstration Account Program for uh, downtown Longfellow site. 
Item 14 is the is a Great Streets Gap financing loan restructure for Catalyst Five Points on West Broadway. Item 15 is an alley vacation. Item 16 are some revised guidelines for the 4D Affordable Housing Incentive Program. This would allow single family homes to enroll as well. Item 17 is an MOU related to stable homes, stable schools. Item 18, probably one of the largest items on our agenda today, is participating in the Met Council's Local Housing Initiatives Account Program. This basically sets the city's goal to build uh, 1,924 to 3,499 new affordable housing units um, for the period between 2021 and 2030. So this is essentially what the city is agreeing to as a goal. And then lastly, and perhaps the most interesting item on the agenda is this really great community preference policy, uh, which would allow us to adopt a community preference for housing programs. This would mean that residents in certain areas would get first option uh, to participate in these homeowner, affordable homeowner initiatives. With that, I'm happy to answer questions or move and move items one through 19 for approval this morning. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman has moved the committee agenda. Is there any discussion? So many good things coming through the committee. Thank you all for that. Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. Thank you, that carries and those items are approved. Next, we have the report from the Policy and Government Oversight Committee given by the Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you so much, Madam President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee brings forward nine items today. Items one, two, three are various legal settlements, the details of which are listed on the agenda. Item number four authorizes an agreement to transfer maps and atlases from the city of Minneapolis to the University of Minnesota. Item number five authorizes a collective bargaining agreement with the IBEW electricians. Item number six is a contract amendment with Ebert Inc. for fire station number four renovations project. Item number seven is various contract amendments with vendors for short term investments of city funds. Um, item number eight authorizes a non disclosure agreement with Ingenico, Ingenico Retail Enterprise US Inc. for credit card processing. Item number nine is a contract amendment with Terminal 4 Inc for support and maintenance of the city's web content management system. I move approval of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee report. Thank you, Council Vice President has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those items are approved. Next is the report from the Public Health and Safety Committee given by the Chair Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward nine items for approval today. The first is referring to staff. 
uh, the subject matter of a surveillance ordinance of two um, surveillance ordinances. Um, item number two is setting a public hearing for November 5th, 2020 to consider the neighborhood's 2020 plan. Item number three is accepting a grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for uh, lead based paint community education. Item number four is accepting a grant from the DWI Court State of Minnesota, 4th Judicial District Court for a police liaison and DWI Defendant Monitoring Services. Item number five is authorizing a contract with EIS Acquisitions Inc. for Emergency Operations Center Incident Management Software. Item number five is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety for traffic enforcement related to the uh, Toward Zero Deaths Traffic Enforcement Regional Partnership Program. Item number seven uh, to data um, access uh, many various platforms um, for folks to be able to access data and then as well as a presentation from um, David Kennedy, who's a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and who has been working in Minneapolis since 1997. So with that, I will move approval of these items and I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Cunningham has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Ah, thank you. I'm seeing a note from the clerk which is clarifying the five items that are on the agenda today, which I'm looking at on my computer. Uh, so the uh, grant from US EPA, the DWI court grant case, um, sorry, gr the grant for um, DWI related things, a contract with ESI acquisitions, the um, grant for traffic enforcement and GBI strategy. So Councilor Cunningham has moved those five items and uh, see if there's any discussion. Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those items are approved. Finally, we have the report from the Transportation and Public Works Committee presented by the Chair, Councilmember Reich. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The committee forwards eight items today for council consideration. Item one is the 2021 non-governmental tax exempt assessments uh, for non-governmental properties. Uh, likewise, two is the 2021 non-governmental tax exempt parcels for street maintenance. Uh, the previous one was for light maintenance. Three is the contract amendment with Kimley Horn and Associates for Hennepin Avenue Street Reconstruction Project. Four is the contract amendment with the Michaels Corporation for cleaning and lining of water mains. Five is the contract amendment with Midwest Diesel Services Incorporated for truck parts and services. Six is the 2020 levy of various public works department special assessments. Seven is the Plymouth Avenue North uh, Street Reconstruction Project. And the final item is a bid for fire apparatus parts and services, and that was the sole bid. Uh, Madam President, I move all items as submitted. Councilmember Reich has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. 
That carries and the report is adopted. The next order of business is reports from the special committees and we have a report today from the executive committee from Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, the executive committee brings forward one item today, which is the appointment of um, Brian Tyner to the appointed position of fire chief. Um, I am thrilled to be able to move uh, to refer this appointment to the Public Health and Safety Committee for the setting of a public hearing. Council Vice President has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that is adopted and referred. Next, we have the order of resolutions and we have two honorary resolutions today. First, we have an honorary resolution declaring November 3rd as Election Judge Appreciation Day. Council Member Ellison is our elections chair uh, and brought this. Would you like to make any comments, Council Member Ellison? Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, you know, I, I think that especially this election has been <laughs> incredibly difficult. Um, everyone on the elections team um, and especially our election judges are are um, stepping up in a major way uh, to help our city and to make sure that this election is really accessible. And so uh, I'm, I'm happy to bring this forward and um, and uh, and I really appreciate all of you um, supporting this and 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 supporting the work and respecting the work of our election judges. So I just want to offer that appreciation and uh, of course thank um, thank the clerk and, and his elections team uh, for all the work that they've done so thank you and i know we all share that appreciation for the staff who are working so hard this year in the pandemic next we have the honorary resolution declaring october as domestic violence awareness month councilmember cunningham would you like to make any comments and thank you for bringing this one forward Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, I am honored to bring forward this resolution. Um, I just want to go ahead and read it. I think that it's worthwhile um, for us just to take a moment um, to really reflect on this. Um, so the resolution reads as, whereas domestic violence is one of the most common and least visible forms of violence that affect many areas of life for its primary and secondary vic victims and whereas domestic violence takes many forms including sexual psychological emotional and physical and whereas it can include economic deprivation and isolation that can cause imminent danger and harm to the safety health and well-being of the whole mm. person and whereas victims deserve to be believed when recounting their experiences, it's supported as they make life-changing decisions and offered the community support through protection services and resources. And whereas in 2019, at least 21 Minnesotans were killed due to domestic violence with 16 women murdered by current or former intimate partners, as well as two children, and three bystanders intervener or interveners killed on scene. And whereas, as of October 1st, 2020, at least 22 Minnesotans have been killed due to intimate partner violence, which is already more than all of 2019. And whereas economic justice and financial stability must be named, recognized, and be a part of the resources offered to victims, as it is a direct barrier for those abused. And whereas victims of domestic violence and their children are at risk for homelessness. And whereas same sex relationships, both romantic and platonic, as well as those who identify as transgender and gender nonconforming, experience increased risk and consequences of this violence and are often not categorized in domestic violence studies. 
and whereas children who witness intimate partner violence can often experience lifelong effects, including physical, mental, uh, behavioral and behavioral health issues and early death. And whereas children in homes in which intimate partner violence takes place are disproportionately likely to grow up to be victims and or perpetrators of violence in their own homes and out in the community. And whereas to stop the cycle of intimate partner violence, boys and men must play a role by dismantling cultural norms of toxic masculinity and normalized violence. And whereas all victims and survivors of violence and the diverse ways in which they self-identify deserve to be seen, heard, and treated with respect and dignity. And whereas we have a duty to protect both civil and human rights and enhance our response to victims through regional partnerships, education, outreach, and enforcement of the law. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 has impacted survivors of violence and trauma through increased isolation in unsafe homes, increased strain on volatile situations, and more barriers to seeking help. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the mayor and the city council do hereby declare October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the city of Minneapolis. I would like for us just to take a moment of silence for those who we have lost in 2019 and thus far in 2020 due to domestic violence. So if you'll please join me for a moment of silence. Thank you everyone for, for joining. And I also just wanna give a thank you to the organizations who do this work on the ground, uh, such as the Domestic Abuse Project, the Tubman Center, uh, Cornerstone, Corner House, um, and I'm sure I'm missing some others in this quick uh, succession, but just wanna make sure to take the time to say thank you to all of you who do this work, um, this life-saving work, this life-changing work. Um, and for domestic, uh, victims and survivors, uh, we stand in solidarity with you and want to do everything that we can to help ensure that you are safe uh, and can thrive. Uh, with that, Madam President, I turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Is there any, I will go ahead and move those two resolutions. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion on either of those resolutions? Thank you to both of you again for bringing them forward. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those resolutions are adopted. The next order of business is unfinished business, and we have one item that was continued from our last regular meeting. This is the proposed ordinance related to commercial property sale to require advanced notice. Uh, Council Member Gordon uh, is in queue to present this item. Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to um, move forward a uh, amended version of the ordinance, and I think everybody should have that and the clerks have it as well. Maybe we can even display it um, on the screen and I can um, uh, it, it kind of go over the main things, but I just want everybody to know that um, you may recall we postponed this. This went through a committee without recommendation and we postponed it at the council twice. And I think we are ready now and we've come back with a modified ordinance um, working closely with uh, my co-author, uh, Council Member Cano. Basically, what we've done at following um, two meetings that I actually have had with um, property owners, uh, especially some of the larger real estate associations and organizations about this is limiting. It, we have limited or um, brought back the scale of this ordinance. Originally, it was proposed to be um, notice about sales of uh, commercial and industrial property citywide. Um, we've taken the industrial 
real properties out of this. And I'll just note that we never included the downtown um, business district, uh, which has its own zoning. Um, but we've also now limited it to the cultural districts. Um, this started because we were concerned. Um, I would have been concerned for a long time about the loss of affordable um, commercial property in the city of Minneapolis. And um, I'm sure I've shared with many of you what I've seen happen in some parts of our city, even when we make an enormous public investment like a light rail line, what that seems to do to have ripple effects on the um, property values and the market in terms of commercial property. And so there are certain areas of the town where we've lost lots of our um, smaller independent businesses um, because of a gentrification that kind of occurs or a displacement that kind of occurs when the property values go up and more people are interested in it. Um, when we were looking at the what had happened after the riots and the destructions of many properties in the city of Minneapolis recently, we realized that there, would, there was a risk there of a lot of properties being sold and you know, potentially flipped and changing in value. So we thought advance notice would make a lot of sense. Um, I actually had people coming to me suggesting it, thinking that would give others an opportunity maybe to come in who might be more community oriented um, in doing some development there. So we drafted the first ordinance. After these meetings, um, we narrowed it down quite a bit. We've taken some of the requirements out of the ordinance, but it still maintains the 60 day notice. Um, I will tell you that um, it was a little bit challenging for me to restrict it to cultural districts because there are no cultural districts in the second ward and this actually excludes some of the properties there. But then I went back and I and I looked at some of the um, work we've done on the cultural districts and um, including um, policy 34 in our comp plan that calls this out. And it really um, was clear to me that this was kind of this this notice. This is the first place we should probably be applying it. I don't know if you were call um, the specifics of that, but in that policy, we say that given the history of redlining and economic exclusion, the city will designate cultural districts to prevent the displacement of low income residents while nurturing thriving commercial corridors. We also say the city of Minneapolis's cultural district designation will allow for the creation and prioritized implementation of new investment tools, policies and practices that directly respond to the needs of POCII communities to stop the displacement of those communities and advance racial equity in Minneapolis. So I think this idea gives us an opportunity to pilot and try out this advance notice of sale. And I think it will also help us um, maximize maybe some of the benefits that we can get of the designation of the cultural districts. So I will move this forward and happy to discuss it more. It gets a second. Thank you, Council Member. I'll, I'll second the motion for discussion purposes, and uh, we have several council members in queue. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I I will state that I'm pleased that this um, uh, amended um, ordinance is uh, now limited to cultural districts. Um, that is. Um, as you all know, something that, um, you know, equity and preventing displacement in those um, districts are utmost um, important to myself uh, and I think all of us as, as our um, strategic and racial equity plans have exhibited. Um, I'm just curious, Council Member, because one of the things that I keep hearing from constituents is that they feel like there's been little public engagement or input. So I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that. And then is there a plan or how will we communicate this to small uh, business owners, this this messaging to small uh, commercial property owners um, so that they are aware of, of this ordinance and not um, in violation, as it were. So I can um, respond to that a little bit. Um, we, I think that in the delays and in the reaching out, I think we were able to um, communicate more fully. I will admit that in the um, crafting of the original design, it was focused more 
working with our partners um, in the second, the ninth, and the eighth ward, including the Lake Street Council and others, where it was discussed extensively at some of the meetings with those business associations and those community organizations. But with the extra time, we were also able to reach out to other property owners and organizations and meet with them. I know they also met with our economic um, development um, director, uh, Eric Hansen, um, and had discussions with them. And I had two um, virtual meetings with, uh, with groups of leaders in the area there. So we were able to have those discussions. A lot of the changes and the details and some of the exemptions actually came from conversations right there. Um, we also have business licensing that's been involved in this. And I think one of the things that we can do is certainly push out the information um, that way. I think this delay has also helped people learn a lot more about it and there's more conversations going on out there. Um, but once, um, hopefully, if this passes, then there will certainly be an implementation plan and, and a communication plan that we'll have to follow. Thank you, Councilmember. I just want to note um, before we continue that there is a note from the clerk that um, there's some technical issues. So I just want to pause and make sure that we should continue here with this discussion or if we should wait until those are resolved. Madam President, the uh, live stream that's showing on the city's YouTube channel is still proceeding. The uh, television broadcast is temporarily down. I would recommend that if possible, we just suspend recess briefly um, and folks can turn off their cameras and microphones and I'll let you know as soon as that uh, broadcast signal is back up and running. Should just be a few minutes. OK, thank you, Mr. Clark. So with that, we will just um, briefly do you want me to officially recess this meeting. Sounds like it. Yeah, that'd be uh, yeah. great. Thank you. We'll take a recess um, until the clerk notifies us that the feed is back. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The regular broadcast of the city Minneapolis City Council is now resuming. Madam President, we've got the stream back up, so as soon as you're ready, we will uh, resume the meetings where we left off. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'll call the meeting back to order. Um, we were just in the middle of a discussion um, where Councilmember Gordon was answering a question from Council Vice President 
about the process of this ordinance development. Council Vice President, did you have anything else um, as a follow up? There are a lot of other customers in queue as well, but I want to make sure you have a chance to finish up if you had anything further. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think um, Councilman Gordon um, answered my question insufficiently. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson is next. Thank you, Madam President. And I want to start off by saying I really appreciate the intention of the authors on this ordinance. I think this is a huge issue that we're facing in the community around affordable commercial uh, space and seeing gentrification happen. And I'm very uh, much looking at a number of solutions. I know we've uh, worked on uh, some different pieces of this together as well. And uh, we have additional uh, things that are being worked on, such as a resolution supporting community-led efforts uh, around really a lot of the epicenter of the civil unrest and destruction that we've seen in Greater Longfellow. Um, that said, I do have concerns with both the process and the substance of this. Um, I want to start by noting that I know that Councilmember Gordon has done a, a bunch of outreach on this, particularly to um, kind of centralized business associations, Beaumont, uh, I believe Lake Street Council, and so I appreciate that. Uh, but with this latest scope, we really have hundreds of individual property owners that are going to be impacted. And I'm wondering, do these property owners really know about this and the impact? Um, We've seen multiple changes in direction happen with this ordinance. And so my concern is that uh, they're not really aware that this is affecting uh, them and what their responsibilities would be under it. From a process standpoint, I'd really like to see this go back to committee for another public hearing and uh, notice sent to property owners so that they know about the impacts. I, I mean, to be quite frank, that if this passes uh, today or later, those property owners are going to have to receive notice anyways. It is better to do that notice on the front end when they know that this is being contemplated rather than uh, after it's passed where they feel like, wow, you know, this happened without even knowing about it and it really impacts um, them. Uh, another piece from a process standpoint is uh, I haven't heard, but would be interested to hear from the authors about uh, CPED capacity for this. I know um, on other things we're working on, CPED says they do not have staff capacity. Uh, they continue to hit that message over and over again. So the idea of CPED now taking on this additional work that's going to have them um, taking potentially notice from uh, these hundreds of properties uh, and then distributing them out throughout the community each time so that we're able to actually uh, realize the intent of this of retaining community ownership and making sure that community development corporations and nonprofits and others know about sales happening uh, is frankly a big undertaking and it, it has a resource impact. I'd like to understand uh, that better from CPED's standpoint. And if we are going to be deprioritizing any work within CPED in order to um, take on this additional work, uh, or if there are additional uh, resources being proposed in this case to do this work. Um, on the substance of this, the, the solution itself, you know, if the goal is to have these nonprofits uh, acquire properties so that they can be more community centric, and, and that is the goal in a lot of cases. I understand there's cases where there's a separate owner from a tenant, but there's also a lot of independent small business owners that are running the businesses out of these properties. Um, if that's the intent, is to be able to communicate that um, with community development and corporations and such, which I understand this is the intent, you know, that can already happen today without uh, this regulation or ordinance in place. There is not only nothing stopping, but really these community development corporations should be reaching out to property owners within the areas of their work and asking them, what are your plans for this property? And if you do go, out for sale, we would be interested in discussing uh, acquisition with you. Um, and that would allow them to connect up sooner than uh, 60 days notice, which at, at in a real estate world, frankly, is scrambling uh, to try to pull together funds and make things happen if you're not expecting it. So I personally think it's better to be proactive and do that work on the front end 
Instead, this really puts things backwards. And instead of doing the outreach to property owners and saying, hey, we're interested in acquiring your property or, hey, we're interested in keeping this owned within the community, it's now forcing all the individual property owners to essentially report um, that out. I do have concerns with the legality of this and also the enforceability. Um, you know, what is the consequence if a property owner doesn't know about this and uh, decides to make a sale and they're in violation of this? Is it a $200 fine, which is the uh, administrative citation? If so, they're just gonna do that. They're gonna pay the fine or the fee um, and it's $200 less that they'll have. And it hasn't actually materialized in the outcome that we're seeking um, to do. Uh, it also comes with an unintended consequence or cost with this. If you're a small independent uh, business owner, you own this property of yours and you want to go to sell and now you realize, hey, I got to wait an extra two months. That's two more months of holding that you're going to have to pay commercial property taxes, which are higher, by the way, than residential property taxes. So it comes with a cost of likely a thousand plus dollars, sometimes in some cases, several thousand dollars uh, for these property owners if there's that delay that's added on. And so, you know, is the city going to be paying that cost or is it just expected they're going to pay that cost so that there's the benefit of the city knowing in advance um, of, of uh, their intent to sell? Um, and then that kind of ties back into the piece of is this actually getting us to that outcome? Because are they actually inking a deal or coming up with a sale first and then they just simply have to sit on their hands for 60 days in order to comply with this ordinance? Or would they just pay the $200 administrative fee? So, um, you know, when I think about these things, I think, is this really the right solution for the problem we're trying to solve? To me, the solution that we should be looking at for this is putting together a funding source and whether it's leveraging our bonding uh, capacity or um, having a separate pool like our affordable housing trust fund to have an affordable commercial trust fund and to be able to um, preserve some of these uh, spaces and actually go out and talk to property owners to understand their plans. And if they're interested in selling, then the city could procure sites. We would have a much more generous timeline and able to be able to work uh, to selling to other community owners. We'd be able to put out RFPs, which would then actually be able to better control the outcomes so that we could actually see uh, in uh, the materialization of what the community is interested in happening with those spaces. So I think if we're actually interested in driving the outcomes, that's the better solution. I realize that's gonna take a lot more work and that will actually take a commitment on our parts to uh, dedicate resources, but I think that's the way to go. And finally, you know, with this, I just have to say, no one's been asking us for this particular ordinance or lobbying on it as far as I can tell. And I work very closely with some of these organizations, whether it's like Street Council or Seward Redesign um, or others. And the only emails I've gotten have been from people really concerned about the unintended consequences of this uh, and the costs associated with it and it not uh, resulting in what we want it to result in. I have not had anyone reaching out saying, hey, this is a really great solution that's going to solve this problem. So I really, really appreciate the intent behind this. I think that's an intent we should absolutely work towards solutions on. I'm committed to continuing doing that work with my colleagues, but I can't support this ordinance today as it's written. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Johnson. We have a number of council members in queue to speak. Councilmember Goodman, then Kano, then Osman. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is a hot mess. It's bad on a process point of view and it's not going to achieve the goal that the authors intend it to achieve. So I'll break this down. We had a public hearing in committee and not one person spoke. No one sent a comment. No one signed up on the phone call because no one had any idea this was happening. It then moved forward to the city council where folks in the community heard it was happening and were in touch with council member Gordon who has been trying to work with them in all fairness for about three weeks. When council member Glidden and I authored advance notice of sale for affordable housing units, we spent three years, probably a year too long in my opinion, but three years working on trying to 
get some sort of consensus and something that would actually work. We have the support of staff as well as a large number of people in the industry itself saying that this was a problem we could solve by advance notice. Here, this notice does not stop displacement. It just doesn't. All it does is delay a sale. That's what it's about. We might as well call it the delay of sale ordinance because that's what it does. And I think what is misunderstood here is there are tons of BIPOC people who own buildings too. And they're the ones who are going to be negatively affected. They're probably not even aware that this is something that's happening right now. So those of you who have these properties in the cultural districts see this as a benefit. I'm not sure what benefit. It's almost like punishing small business owners in commercial and uh, cultural corridors by telling them they cannot sell their businesses without putting out some sort of notice. So it's actually something that feels good, but is not going to have the intent of having a property owner who has now been delayed for two months from selling their property to turn around and sell it to someone we want them to sell it to. It's almost like torturously interfering with a sale or contract. It just makes no sense to me. So we have an issue with the public hearing that no one spoke at and the extent of the engagement was three weeks with a couple council members as well as a number of emails to the rest of us. And we have something that just does not solve the problem. This is not going to stop displacement, not at all. All it's doing is slowing a sale and we have no idea who these property owners are who could be affected. Yes, there could be people who've owned properties for long periods of time and they might not be BIPOC, but I bet there are BIPOC people who own buildings in these cultural corridors too, who might have very good reason to sell and do not want to be delayed. And when they find out that they have to be delayed, they're going to be even more mad. They're not gonna say, yes, thank you for delaying me so that I can sell to who you want me to sell to. That's not gonna happen. This is a capitalistic environment, real estate. People are going to sell to the highest price. That's how real estate works. And so I really feel like what we're doing is we're telling people we can solve a problem through this that we cannot solve. Councilmember Johnson did a very good job of outlining all of the implementation problems with this and the notice problems with this. I do think that the concern about properties being sold out from under tenants is legit. That's what leases are for. And maybe there is something we can do as it pertains to the way commercial um, properties and cultural districts deal with leases with their tenants. But even that I would think would have some level of property right associated with it. Ultimately, this is promising people something we simply can't do. And I can't do that because I don't feel that this is helping properties and cultural districts. If anything, it's tying their hands. Thank you, Council Member Cano. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I uh, appreciate the conversation here. Uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Gordon, for all of the work that um, your office has been willing to do with me on this front. I want to go back to a little bit of the history of how this ordinance idea um, came to be. So, when COVID 19 hit, my office uh, took on a weekly uh, briefing with uh, Lake Street uh, stakeholders and Latino leaders throughout the Twin Cities region to talk about what were we going to do as a community to support one another through this um, uh, unprecedented time. And so we would meet weekly from 12 to 1.30 p.m. It was a, a huge toll on my office because we would have to line up speakers and we would have to get the agendas ready. Um, it was a, a kind of an insane uh, work um, pace. And slowly uh, when the civil unrest hit our city and uh, Lake Street was decimated, um, we began to shift those meetings to include conversations about Lake Street recovery. And so those meetings, um, as I mentioned, would happen weekly. Um, it was uh, nonprofit leaders, um, workers' rights organizations, foundations, nonprofits, uh, businesses, uh, residents, and um, 
we would talk about what are we going to do to save save Lake Street? What are some of the regulatory measures that can be put in place to ensure that vulnerable vulnerable businesses were not going to be displaced and gentrified out of Lake Street once these buildings became available for either resale or reconstruction um, or, or any other sort of economic shift that would happen as a result of the unplanned for um, global pandemic and the civil unrest. So through those conversations, uh, we explored a lot of different things, rent control for commercial properties, eminent domain, um, certainly uh, right of first uh, refusal um, for tenants. And so those conversations started to evolve and a lot of those ideas were um, essentially ideas that could not be pursued uh, due to state level restrictions. Um, it's my understanding that a lot of those ideas might still live within a legislative um, bill that has been proposed at the state level, but has not been approved. Uh, I believe it's called the Promise Act, and one of the authors is uh, State Representative uh, Mahmoud Noor. And, and so there, there is a lot of interest to pursue these kinds of protections for areas that are extremely vulnerable and that are facing very unique circumstances, circumstances that are not uh, replicable or seen in other parts of our city. Uh, I drive to other wards and the difference is night and day. I mean, I feel like I'm in a different country <laughs> when I go to some of the other wards in our city. And so it's, it's appropriate that I think this uh, ordinance went through so much vetting and conversation, both from its birth to now its uh, proposed vote. Um, I've been thankful that we've been uh, able to delay twice uh, this vote and that there has been uh, a lot of conversations outside of this particular televised meeting to engage people with it, with its further um, iterations. Um, Certainly, I don't want council members to erase all of the work that has happened that has not hit your desk, but that the rest of us have been carrying on our shoulders because we face the destruction of Lake Street. And so I think it's really important from a racial equity and racial justice analysis to honor that work and to honor that voice, which is a lot of the voices that the council members of color carry on this uh, body um, because of the nature of what our districts represent and who lives here. Um, and so the the time came to narrow uh, zero in on, on some kind of measure that the council could do, uh, that the city could do on this front because it just felt like all of the power lay in other people's hands. And so it's important for us to demonstrate what we can do for our communities in, in much the same way that Councilmember Cunningham is, is doing what he can for his community around violence prevention and um, Reducing, reducing uh, some of the harm that that he has seen spiked up in his um, in his ward. It's the same thing that some of us are doing for for our ward on this particular issue because our portion of Lake Street was uh, extremely impacted in ways that others weren't. And so when we started to put this idea together, I reached out to Councilmember Schrader, um, Councilmember Gordon, and Councilmember Ellison because I knew they had a strong body of work on this. Um, similar issue, but but in the housing uh, world. And so there um, we decided to go ahead and put together this idea and to work with staff on it. Staff have been very involved from the city attorney's office to, to CPED. And I think that a lot of the questions and concerns that Councilmember Johnson has put on the table are certainly um, legitimate and, and very applicable to be operationalized under the purview of city staff as we look into implementation once we decide as a body if this is something we will approve today. Obviously, I would like for us to approve this today. Um, so, so we had several meetings with council members to come up with the, the design and the concept. We certainly went through the most formal, official and public process that any city ordinance has to take. Um, and that's no secret because it's been publicly codified and public hearing, a public hearing was, was held, which is um, our, I, our paramount way of signifying that we're working on something. Um, so that, that led to us uh, here where we are today after a lot of conversations and, and rightly so, the ordinance began as a very big citywide approach uh, because that's what some of the council members who were supporting this initiative thought could be done. And at the time we as authors agreed and we thought it would be a good idea 
to go after a citywide uh, approach. And then we started to have more conversations with all of you. And then it was decided that it was best to be presented as a cultural districts um, application, which also feels right. That's that's totally fine. We can we can try it at that level. And um, and should this um, ordinance uh, have uh, unintended negative racial impacts on uh, low income communities and communities of color, which is the, the communities we're trying to uplift through this work uh, by leveling the playing field of how um, commercial property sales are done. Uh, then we certainly as a body have the power to rescind that ordinance, much like we did with lurking and and say, you know what, this did not have the intended outcome or much in the same way that we had to do a moratorium on tobacco only shops because they were being concentrated in low income wards. And, and so there's always this kind of healthy mechanism of checks and balances that we as a body get to enact. So I would say that giving this ordinance um, an opportunity to live and to um, be implemented is really important because there has been a lot of community engagement, particularly particularly from those uh, who are um, in vulnerable situations, uh, who don't speak English, who don't have the ability to hire uh, anybody to lobby for them or to um, navigate the, the difficult terrain of commercial estate. In some instances, we know that commercial uh, properties are sold over cocktails. They are not sold in a fair and free market where um, a person of color is seen or valued as an equal player in the broader uh, scheme of who owns our city and who, right, who has rights to our city. And so I just want to um, clarify that the intent of this policy is advance notice. Advance notice. We are not asking the city to buy property. We all know that that money is, is small and dwindling. Um, if other council members want to get more money to buy property, please, by all means, I will support you in that. I think that's a great idea. It's a great addendum to this body of work, but that is not the intent of this resolution, um, of this ordinance. This ordinance is strictly about leveling the playing field and making those commercial property sales, uh, making that process more transparent making that process more equitable, allowing other players to be able to compete fairly in a social network and social capital game that they're not set up for to succeed in. And frankly, if people of color own land on, in these um, corridors, I think it's great that they're going to be held to the same standard because some of our folks, when they get money and they make it big, they don't think about the little guy that they once were and how they can support those folks. And to that end, I should note that there is already a um, commercial land trust model that has been worked on for the last five years and the city of lakes land trust is the holder of that process and that project and they've been facing a lot of challenges because they need to be able to buy land at a cheap enough price sometimes a dollar uh, to be able to make it financially sustainable for the commercial land trust to survive and live and so those ideas, you know, have do exist and they exist outside of the city. The city has supported them, but the city can't be the, the driver of some of those things for legal reasons and for um, purchasing power reasons. If the city's involved in any sale of any property, you all know that this, uh, the price of that property goes up because everybody thinks the city has so much money. So, so uh, there's a lot of things that are, are at work here that, that do complement each other. And what this particular ordinance does is add to that ecosystem of equality, of accessibility, of transparency, of anti-displacement, anti-gentrification work that we as a body have said many times we want to be supportive of and a leader in. So I don't think this is the antithesis to that. And I also don't think this is the silver bullet to how we're going to save our city from the destru destruction that's happened to it. I think this is actually one chapter in a much bigger book that I hope the rest of you and all of us can build more chapters into. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, you know, I don't want people to be confused that this is about the city buying property, not at all. This is strictly about more transparency in that commercial sale um, industry and making sure that folks are transparent with their intents and their decisions when they're trying to get rid or dispose of their property. 
And at the end of the day, you know, if folks don't want to sell their property, they don't have to. They can rescind that move. They don't have they're not forced to continue with a sale that that doesn't seem to be fitting their needs. And certainly if over time we see that this ordinance doesn't have an intended um, positive impact or in fact that it's having a detrimental impact on communities, we can certainly rescind it from the books just like we've done with some other ordinances. So I don't want us to feel like the sky is falling here. I want us to look at this as one of the many, many things that our uh, council and staff and, um, and residents have been doing to try to reduce displacement, reduce uh, gentrification in areas that have already been targeted for that kind of um, change. So with that, I'll just say that um, I'm, I'm feeling really good about the process we put together. There's been a lot of input already. It, this idea comes from those very impacted communities who have been left behind and left out of a lot of conversations that um, are taking place about recovery. And um, I really hope that we can all um, come together to support this and approve it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Osman and then Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I think it's important to keep our cultural district in the hands of the community that live there. Even though we haven't seen any wave of large corporation coming in on Lake Street and, you know, buying the properties, I think it's too early. Um, I have a concern, however, this doesn't only open up on private property transaction between sellers and big corporation, but also will highlight the transaction between our local community business owners Right now, locals often sell to locals or within the same cultural because of trust, comfortability, and because that's where their connections are. Um, I trust the community to continue to sell with cultural integrity in mind, uh, but you know, a large bit is always excited to a seller. Um, it's very important that, uh, um, as Council Member Kano put it very well, that uh, it's is to reduce, um, you know, displacement for the folks that have been affected heavily on the the civil unrest and uh, property damages that have been there. Um, that's why I believe it's important that we build up a political agency and community ownership over this commercial corridor. Um, especially for Le for East Lake Street, Councilmember and I, Councilmember Kano and I, um, are planning to introduce resolution in the near future, recognizing the formal coalition of immigrant business owners on East Lake Street that that their voice is present on every rebuilding effort that we make uh, on cultural uh, corridors. If we um, and the business owners are successful in powering the, this coalition, I believe an audience like the one we're talking about and the one we're about to vote on could give them a tool to better preserve cultural vibrancy on East Lake Street um, uh, business corridors. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I appreciate the um, intention behind this ordinance um, and and really from my understanding is that the outcome intended for this ordinance is to increase community ownership and prevent gentrification and displacement. Um, the concern that I have is that I, I have not really seen any evidence that this particular approach will achieve that outcome. Um, 60 days is not like having an additional 60 days does not clear the barriers that are in place for um, BIPOC community members to be able to buy commercial property. Um, research, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to Black community and Black entrepreneurs and and um, and business owners, because uh, I've read quite a bit of research, but um, the the barriers are um, lack of access to capital, 
lack of access to credit and a trust gap. So not trusting the systems in order that are involved, like the governments, like banks, like real estate companies. Um, and so those barriers, none of those are addressed through a 60 day delay. Um, and after the 60 days, um, the property will still be sold to the highest bid. Free market capitalism still happens after that. Um, I just, based on, like, I, I don't have, I've not heard yet a clear connection between the this particular approach and the outcomes um and and there are a lot of gaps of barriers um that are unaddressed still through this particular approach and so if there's not a clear connection between like logical connection between this approach and the outcomes um but we see ways that it doesn't address to achieve those outcomes, then my concern is that really what we're doing is we're opening up for space for unintended consequences. Um, this feels very high risk um, without having again addressed many of the underlying issues that prevent folks from BIPOC communities from being able to own commercial real estate. Um, Again, I agree with the intention of this, uh, of this ordinance, of this work. Um, and also, I, I do not see how this ordinance is going to be able to achieve the outcomes that folks are looking to um, achieve. So, um, so as of right now, I cannot support this ordinance. Um, I would support it going, uh, being referred back um, to staff for, for more work to be done. Um, if that's something that folks are open to, um, but I think that I, I think that this is very high risk and, and there isn't a lot of evidence behind, um, why this particular approach will achieve the outcomes that folks are looking for. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Council member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> um, you know, no one strategy uh, on any issue that we have uh, taken up as a council has been um, fixed with a single policy. You know, our housing policy, I think every single council member here has uh, has addressed housing in some way, and each policy sort of builds on the next one in order to, to, to reach the outcome uh, that we're looking for. Um, you know, I think about the, uh, the preference policy that staff has been working on, which I think is an incredible policy. Um, which I think is going to help um, address some of the displacement uh, issues that we're having and address gentrification and, and, and the kind of um, uh, development that leads to displacement of, of working class people and people who have, you know, um, made certain neighborhoods their homes for a long time. Uh, but again, uh, without, you know, lack, but with lack of access to capital and all these things, uh, that policy does not solve that on its own. But we do have other programs and policies to address those things. And so what the policy does is it allows space for us to, for, for people to capitalize on those things. I think here, uh, a part of uh, what we're doing um, is we are developing sort of an uh, affordable housing trust fund, but for commercial businesses, right? Uh, we've got the, the, the commercial property development fund, which is a new fund. Uh, and folks are already taking advantage of that um, along some of the corridors, uh, but, it needs more resources, which I believe we're going to be we're going to continue that investment, uh, and uh, and and folks need time in order to build out their their financing. And I think that 60 days is not going to inherently fix that issue, uh, but some folks do need more time, uh, and the amount of time that they're that they have now is 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 virtually none. And so this policy is not meant to address. Uh, every single issue uh, that goes with um, the, 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 the buying and selling of commercial property, but I think uh, is sort of one more link in a chain that will, that will make it easier for, um, for small businesses to, uh, uh, to, to be able to own the corridors that they occupy. 
Um, you know, I, I'd say along in North Minneapolis, I don't I don't know about you all, but in North Minneapolis, significant a significant amount of, pro of the property is not owned by uh, by folks of color or folks living in the neighborhood. Um, a significant of the property uh, is 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 already sort of monopolized by just a small handful of people um, who sort of trade, you know, past properties among each other uh, outside of the reach of the average person in North Minneapolis. And so uh, and so I don't think that this I, I think that the the uh, the likelihood that this property is going to impede uh, the small business owner selling to the small business owner, at least in places like North Minneapolis, is not likely uh, because we already have such um, uh, uh, so little local ownership already, which we're trying to attain. And I think that this policy could help us uh, take one step closer to 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 making that a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Gordon. Thank you, and I think Council Member Ellison said it pretty well. Um, I do want to thank everybody for um, the discussion around this, both um, here at the committee, but also conversations that I've had the opportunity to have with people um, in the last four weeks um, when we um, have taken the delays, which were actually in addition to the um, notice of intent that was publicly noticed. And I certainly had a lot of communication just after giving that notice of intent with people who were interested. And then the subject introduction as well. And then we had another cycle where it was referred to the committee and then it was referred to staff and then it came back for the public hearing. So we've had a lot of time to have a lot of discussion and I'm really grateful for everybody that um, gave input both um, within City Hall here. And I will tell you that we have had great support from CPED and the attorney's office all along the way. One of the things that actually came up early on um, was some discussions about would anybody actually take advantage of this? And I would encourage Council Member Cunningham to continue working and looking at that because when we reached out um, in this side of town and talked to some of the community developers, nonprofits, individuals, they indicated that they would and that there was even funding sources available to help them um, make an offer if they had time to know what was for sale and where. Also, um, there's something very interesting about this whole um, realtors business that has me deeply concerned because some of these deals actually happen and properties are never listed. It feels like you need to be in a position to know somebody who knows somebody um, and I will tell you there's a certain demographic of all those people who come to the meetings in terms of um, they look very similar. Um, and I guess I'll just leave it there. Um, but this will open it up, make it more transparent. And I think there are potentially going to be some opportunities. Um, and um, I also want to just call out the potential um, to implement one of the strategies we also have in the cultural districts was to help create and prioritize the implementation of cooperative based economic and housing development strategies such as cooperatively owned housing and commercial land trusts to secure long-term affordability and greater equitable outcomes so i think that's really a key to this and of course it's only one piece and i'll have to say that a lot of what i've heard from all of you would be great complementary pieces that could go along with this but this is one thing that has minimal costs and I would say minimal risks, especially if we look at how much trouble we got in with advance notice of sale for our um, housing requirements. I think we've seen that has not um, brought us anything negative so far at all. So I'll leave it there and um, encourage people to vote for this. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I put myself in queue for a couple of reasons. One, I set a bad example of using the chat to make a comment. So um, I did want to just point out that Council Member Ellison already covered this point, but um, I did want to share that we do have a commercial property development fund recently created, um, and that is a great tool that we could use and build on for some of the things that Council Member Johnson and others were describing. So there is a base um, tool to use for some of those enhancements that have been described. Um, I'm really torn about this item. I am concerned that we didn't have final language um, available for the hearing. Um, I know that we um, often 
edit and amend items as they come through our process. Um, but since this has been at council and not at committee, um, I think often these details and this kind of discussion would have normally happened at committee, um, uh, you know, allowing the, with the council members who serve there to really dig in on, on these details. Um, I, you know, I think I agree with um, some of the comments about how we often take an incremental approach to change, and I'm not someone who typically wants to delay things just for delay's sake. Um, I, you know, I will note that some of the comparisons between this and the residential side, I mean, we are very limited in our tools on commercial um, anti-displacement policy. It's super frustrating and I appreciate um, the work that's going in to build more tools to stop displacement in commercial. Um, I, this doesn't include the kind of renter protections that came along with the notice of sale on the residential side, which I think were so important to really achieving that goal of anti-displacement or lessening the impact of emplacement um, of displacement on renters um, on the residential side. Um, so, you know, I, I think I would probably support sending this back to committee to let staff have more time to work on it. I'm hearing enough support from the council members who represent the areas that, um, you know, I, I also do want to support our colleagues who are um, dealing with so much um, devastation in their wards. Uh, and just a final note, just for where I'm coming from as the Ward 10 Council Member, I represent a part of town that is just outside of cultural districts that has um, been facing immense um, displacement pressure, um, especially impacting immigrant owned businesses and residents of color. Um, and so I just am always, I just want to say that I am always conscious about how our, our policies to focus resources and tools and cultural districts might affect those businesses or residents that are just on the border who aren't protected or, um, or targeted for resources. And I support the approach of cultural districts. I think it is important to target resources. In geographic areas, I think it is a sound tool, but I think as we go on and adding extra layers um, to this um, tool of using cultural districts, that asking that question about, you know, how is this impacting um, folks who are just outside the area is worth stating and asking and reflecting on. Um, so those are my comments. I mostly wanted to clarify that or just say out loud the comments that I put in the chat because I'm always encouraging people not to use the chat that way. Is there any further discussion? Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam President. I, I, I too um, am pretty torn on this um, as well. Um, for me, it really comes down to what it, what is going to be the real burden um, on uh, commercial property owners. I, I think my colleagues that had uh, real reservations about the process to get to this point, um, I, those are certainly persuasive with me. Uh, I think there was so much work uh, that had to happen for advance notice, uh, you know, between uh, Councilmember Goodman um, and when I took over, you know, the work that had been done by uh, former Councilmember Glidden. Um, there, there's a reason we haven't seen problems. It's because we were proactive and met with a lot of stakeholders and, and really laid down what was going to be kind of the first policy. And uh, that's also how I view this. This is something that I, I think Councilmember Ellison talked about a well, while, that this is not meant to be um, a kind of cure all for so many things, but it is supposed to be just just one way that the city can get information. Uh, looking over the ordinance, just the amount of information that needs to go to the city, um, I, I do not feel um, is burdensome and I actually think would be helpful just as, just, just as a start. There's a lot of work that has to happen. I really urge the authors um, to work with city staff on how that's being enforced and to after you know hearing the talk today to really try and make sure the intentions um, of all council members that have been said um, to really look out for BIPOC business owners, uh, BIPOC property owners, um, and all the people that really want to make sure that they're they're keeping kind of the, their dollars and their work here in the community. Um, I, I will be supporting this, but I do feel that this still needs a lot of work. I'm sympathetic if uh, one of my colleagues that had concerns wants to bring this back to committee. Um, I would support that as well. Um, I do question uh, what what would change. Um, I think the limited um, limiting this to the cultural districts is, is a good start. I don't know that it gets to the same um, intention of the authors, uh, but it is very difficult to really say to really say uh, without um, 
having it come down to race, um, how what we're specifically targeting and what outcome we want. Um, so with those limited tools, I, I think the cultural districts is a, is a good place to start. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion on this item? Councilor Gordon, did you move this item? Madam President, yeah. I have the I have the um, move from Council Member Gordon, seconded by Council President. I second it. Thank yep. you. That was so well, so long ago. Okay, Council Vice President Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, and thank you, Clerk, for that clarification. And so I'm not sure if this is appropriate at this moment, um, but I, I I would actually like to uh, make a motion to um, to send this back to committee so that we can provide um, opportunity to incorporate some of the discussion that we have had today, um, as well as. Um, set a public hearing. I, I, I am certainly um, in support of the intention of this ordinance. Um, and but in, in many ways, I agree with with Councilmember Goodman that it is really a slow down ordinance. However, I will say that slowing the process down makes sense. And, and does provide uh, an opportunity for alternative um, or community-based um, um, property owners or would-be property owners to, to make a bid on these properties. So I'm not sure if it's when, when is an appropriate time now that we have a, a motion and a proper second and have had all of this discussion to make a a motion to um, to to bring this back to the committee and would um, welcome any advice from the clerk. Council Vice President has made a substitute motion to refer this back to committee. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Any discussion on the substitute motion, Council Member Johnson? Thank you, Madam President, and I'm happy to support that if my colleagues want to go uh, do more work on this. I would have one request when it comes to a public hearing um, because this is affecting a very specific number of properties, hundreds of uh, properties, and it's not a citywide approach. I actually do think it makes sense for the city to send out an actual mailed notice to the property owners. Um, letting them know about the public hearing and this proposed ordinance so that they are aware. Um, obviously, one of the things I touched on is that uh, if we're asking them to hold commercial property for an additional 60 days, or if that is the outcome of uh, a past ordinance like this, it would have a financial cost, uh, likely over a thousand dollars for each property owner. So I think the city spending, you know, a thousand dollars on sending out a mailer to them um, makes sense, especially since uh, we'd have to communicate anyways to them about this should this ordinance pass. So I think it's better to be upfront with them and mail out that notice and let them know that this is something uh, being considered and that way they can have a voice in the process and frankly be more aware of the ordinance should it pass and what their responsibilities would be. So I hope that's something that uh, can be worked on with this. I think that that would be uh, appropriate given all the context in this circumstance. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman. I'm sorry, I thought Councilmember Gordon was first, but oh, then I'll, sorry. Yield, I'll yeah. yield to Councilmember Gordon, your names look so similar, as we all often note. Does and I must say I missed the feature of being able to pull out of the stack and pull in at my discretion, but um, I'm not going to support a postponement at this point. Um, I was um, really um, impressed with some of the comments by Councilmember Cano, Ellison, and um, Trader. I know. Um, 
I try to be open to these things a lot, but I think that um, this is a very small step and we should just be willing to move forward on this now um, instead of taking up all the time. And I think the, the, the problem with the mailing and all these other things, it, um, it, um, I just think we can take this step and begin implementing it and see how well it works. And that's consistent with our comp plan. That's consistent with what we want to do as a city. And I have to tell you, the timing could end up being really, really important depending on how the economy goes and on how many of these properties we lose potentially to um, investors that we don't even know that are part of some um, hidden group somewhere out there. So um, I hopefully we won't postpone it and we can move forward with this today. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Well, as for the hidden investors that are going to buy up all these properties, that's going to happen anyway, uh, because this doesn't stop the sale of any property. It only delays it. I have mixed feelings about moving it back to committee. After hearing the conversation, so many of you laid out such good arguments for any good litigator that I would guess we'd be enjoined from putting this into place anyway. So it's really a question of whether or not you want to fix some of the things that potentially will be brought forward in litigation when we pass this. So if you move it back to committee, the city attorney's office can take a look at the conversation and some of the comments that were made here today and determine whether or not we can fix it in order to prevent litigation going forward. I'll note the residential advance notice process took three years and there was a massive amount of community engagement and multiple public hearings. In this particular case, not one member of the public in this COVID environment got to speak to anyone on the committee or council directly in any kind of video face-to-face -face environment. That in and of itself is probably going to be a problem. Uh, but I, you know, I mean, I'm not anxious to have it back in committee. We have a massive amount of work in the meeting on Monday. We have a lot of items on the 17th and a run up to the December meeting as well. So I guess the authors just need to decide if they want to pass it and immediately probably have a lawsuit or you want to move it forward because it sounds like you have the votes. Having uh, um, having one or two council members having video meetings with a whole bunch of people is not the government being able to talk to all of its elected officials. And so the place for that public information is in a committee meeting. And now that we're even more distanced because of this kind of video thing, people feel like we're just slipping stuff through. And I understand the authors don't feel like they've slipped this through, but three weeks between when it came to the council and today is a lot faster than multiple years. Thank you. I'm just checking back. I don't see anyone else in queue to speak. Is there any further discussion on the delay? Or sorry, the referral back to committee specifically? Uh, seeing no more, I'll, I'll just briefly comment that I'm a bit swayed by some of the comments about the shortfalls of sending it back to committee. I'm really conscious of CPED staff's time right now with all that's being asked of them for rebuilding related work. So I'm not sure, having heard from our colleagues, the real value of, of that um, um, referral back. So uh, I know I had suggested it earlier. Any further discussion on the referral to committee? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll on the substitute item. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. No. Councilmember Cano. No. Councilmember Reich. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. No. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 10 ayes and three nays. That item carries, so it will be referred back to the biz committee. 
Mr. Clerk, can you clarify um, the next steps related to any public hearing that would take place for this item, just since we've had so much discussion about the process? Certainly, Madam President. The matter would be referred back to the next regular meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee because of Election Day next Tuesday, which would have been the regular meeting for that committee. That committee's regular meeting has been rescheduled one day earlier to Monday, so next Monday, November 2 at 1.30. At that time, it would be before the committee and the committee's discretion to set a date for a future public hearing if the committee wished to do so on the uh, amended ordinance as it stands before them at this point or to take other action as appropriate at that point. So once we get it back to the committee, the committee has several options available to it. Again, that committee meeting is removed from its normal time has been rescheduled to Monday next week, November 2 at 1.30. Thank you. That completes that item. Thank you all for the discussion. The next order of business is announcements. Are there any announcements from council members? Mr. Clerk. Uh, Madam President, if there are no announcements from council members, I wanted to share that while we have been in this council meeting, given the court's decision with respect to mail ballots uh, that we discussed earlier in the meeting, uh, the election staff uh, have have determined that they will be increasing or expanding the number of hours that they will be operating our ballot drop off sites. So given this opportunity while we are in session to share both with policymakers and those who are tuned in, normally we would be open uh, tomorrow, Saturday from 9 to 4. We will instead be open from 8 a.m to 6 p.m. at all 13 of our ballot locations. That increases uh, the, the time that we are available on Saturday, and we will increase also on Sunday. We normally would be open from noon until 5 p.m. Instead, we will open at 10 a.m. and stay open until 5 p.m. That adds five additional hours to the hours we were already planning on being open this weekend at our ballot drop-off sites. So all 12 of the city's ballot drop off sites will be open those extended hours. Also in cooperation with our friends at the Hennepin County Elections Office, they also will be increasing the number of hours they are available to accept uh, drop offs from voters across the county, which includes Minneapolis residents. They will be open tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And then on Tuesday of next week, which is election day, I want to reiterate that we will be keeping all of our ballot drop off sites open at the same time that polls are open for in person voting. The ballot drop off sites will be open next Tuesday from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. So we are expanding our weekend hours. We will be open on election day. Uh, a reminder, no mail ballots can be taken to a polling place. Bring them to us at the ballot drop off locations and then ending on a positive note. I just checked with our sources. More than 84 million voters have cast ballots across the nation early. And when we look at some states, Texas, one of our largest states, and Hawaii have both already surpassed the total number of ballots that were passed in the 2016 presidential election. And we still have four days left before Election Day. So please get your ballots back to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and I was trying to get my announcement in prior to uh, the clerk's announcement, but really just wanted to reiterate um, everything the clerk has just announced and encourage our um, faith community to ensure that they are um, encouraging their um, parishioners and congregants and members um, at, at synagogues and mosques and cathedrals and basilicas to, to get out and early vote on Sunday. Um, if you have um, ballots that you have had mailed to you to, to return um, via mail, please drop those off um, at these eight now that we know that there have been expanded hours to these drop off locations. Um, it is just so critical that we make sure that everybody can get out and vote. 
If you are not registered, you can still register at the polls um, on Tuesday. And I, I just want to reiterate my own commitment to ensuring that we have a safe and um, um, valid election process and that I will do everything in my power as an elected official, as an elected representative to ensure that every vote that is cast is counted uh, and that there is safety uh, in the process of voting, uh, both physically and as well as um, for those votes. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Vice President. I don't know how others are feeling heading into next week, but um, I have a sense of, of hope, but also some fear and nervousness about how things will go. We saw um, some comments from state leaders about how this election will feel different this year with more absentee voting. Um, we know that um, we have decisions about ballots being litigated in the courts, including this recent decision about mail-in ballots, which is disappointing and potentially confusing to voters. Um, so I just wanted to say that I am so proud of how this group of council members has been coming together in times of crisis in our city. And I hope for peace um, in the next days and weeks ahead. But I know that if we are facing anything else, that this group of people is still committed to communicating with each other, to supporting each other and our communities. And through this time, especially during unrest, council members have become a go-to for um, our communities to reach out in crisis. Um, and I know it's taken a toll on us and our staff. Um, we're not set up to be a crisis hotline, a 24 seven, 24 hours, seven days a week um, crisis response team. But in some ways we have become that. And I know all of us are, are here to do that for our community, for our neighbors who we love and who we stepped up to serve. Um, so I just want to um, end with my gratitude to each of you for all that you're doing in your communities um, with your neighbors. And again, very hopeful that um, that we will see a peaceful time in the weeks ahead. Um, I know that we are preparing and setting up for every possible circumstance, um, you know, that we might face. And um, and I know that each of you will will be there for your communities no matter what happens. So just thank you. Um, anything further? Seeing none and with no further business before us, without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Have a safe and uh, maybe healthy slash sugary, uh, unusual Halloween weekend. Um, appreciate all of you. We are adjourned. <laughs>